Greetings, welcome to Saving Green. My name is Josh, and today we're gonna to talk about the most important take home messages from the IPCC 6 report on the basic science of climate change. There's a lot of information, but if you're too busy to read it, this is what you should know. Okay, so here's the crux of the report. Greenhouse gases from human activity have already caused irreversible changes in every aspect of our planet, namely surface temperatures, ocean pH and sea levels, polar ice mass, extreme weather events like floods and hurricanes, precipitation patterns, etc. Atmospheric carbon will continue to change our climate in some predictable and unpredictable ways as we continue to pump it into the atmosphere. Nothing really that new. But what is new is how the authors use predictive models and meta-analyses to determine how likely or not a certain scenario actually is. The added certainty is so important to highlight because things that were possible before are even more likely now. Now I talked about this in detail in my previous video, which you can check out here if you'd like. This report suggests that cause and effect relationships are more tightly linked than in previous iterations. For example, in section A15, they say, quote, human influence is very likely the main driver, meaning greater than 50% influence, of the global retreat in glacial sea ice since the 1990s, and the decrease in snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere since 1950. However, they admit that there is limited evidence with medium confidence of human influence on the Antarctic ice sheet mass loss. So they are only stating the facts to a degree of certainty that the data allow. Would it make sense that human greenhouse gas emissions are also warming the Southern Hemisphere and impacting Antarctic sea ice? Well, of course, but to date, the evidence just isn't as strong. Again, in my previous video, I went through extensively why you should trust this report and not focus on individual case reports, naysayers, or outliers. The over 700 expert authors poured over 14,000 studies and had to agree on practically every word in this report, especially the summary for policymakers. But today, I aim to only focus on the findings that are supported by the strongest evidence, those most likely to occur. These are the findings that have over 95% certainty or those that are designated with, quote, very high confidence or scenarios that are, quote, extremely likely or, quote, virtually certain. Now, we should be mindful here. High confidence or even likely is still compelling evidence and should be regarded with a certain degree of expectation. But there are some findings that are just so compelling it's worth focusing just on those. And that's what I want to discuss in today's video. So here are the most incontrovertible points from the AR6 for each aspect of our planet, namely atmosphere, oceans, temperature, and weather, and general trends for the future. So let's talk about the atmosphere. While atmospheric CO2 concentrations in 2019 were higher than at any point in 2 million years, that's with high confidence, concentrations of methane and N2O or nitrous oxide were higher than at any point in the last 800,000 years. Methane and CO2 concentrations are up 47% and 156% respectively over multi-millennial glacial and interglacial periods over the last 800,000 years. These are both global warming gases. N2O, a potent greenhouse gas, about 300 times as potent as carbon dioxide, is up 23% and still falls within the range of natural or expected concentrations over that same period. Now this graph on page eight kind of shows how the human emissions of both greenhouse gases and aerosols impact global warming. Point two, anthropogenic CO2 removals, or CDR, and emissions are partially compensated by CO2 release and uptake respectively from our land and ocean carbon pools, or sinks. This is with very high confidence. Now on this graph in 27, it says that unfortunately it's postulated that in relative terms, the fraction of atmospheric carbon taken up by these sinks will diminish in time, thus amplifying the effects of greenhouse radiation. And point three, while it's likely that human emissions have caused a best estimated 1.07 degrees centigrade average surface temperature increase over the last 150 years, it's extremely likely that human caused stratospheric ozone depletion was the main driver of cooling of the lower stratosphere between 1979 and the 1990s. This is a common point of contention for climate change skeptics who misinterpret this temporary cooling period as evidence against the broader global warming trends. Now let's talk about the oceans. The upper ocean, which is the top 700 meters, has warmed since the 1970s and is extremely likely, which is greater than 99% sure, that human influence is the main driver. Human-caused CO2 emissions are the main driver of current global acidification of the surface ocean, the main cause of loss of marine life, and especially coral reef ecosystems as well. Point two, 
over the rest of the 21st century based on multiple lines of evidence, upper ocean stratification, ocean acidification, and ocean deoxygenation, with high confidence, will continue to increase at rates dependent on future emissions. Not good. Point three, the global mean sea level will continue to rise over the 21st century. This is virtually certain, except in a few regions with substantial geologic land uplift rates, like in volcanically active areas or tectonic activity. Basically, Bo Burnham was right. Now let's talk about temperature, weather, and permafrost. Point one. Hot extremes, including heat waves, have become more frequent and intense across most land regions since the 1950s, again, virtually certain. Recent hot extremes would have been extremely unlikely to occur without human influence on the climate system. Here on page 23, since extreme weather occurs in generally isolated events like floods and storms, droughts and wildfires, we can estimate how often they are to occur at each scenario, at least based on historical data. In the most extreme scenarios, 10 or 50 year heat events will almost occur yearly, or 10 to 40 times more frequent as expected based on historical data. Heavy precipitation and agricultural droughts will also become more likely, but to a lesser extent, as shown here. Number two, it's virtually certain that the land surface will continue to warm more than the ocean surface, about one and a half times as much. And Arctic ice will continue to warm more than global surface temperatures on average, with a high confidence above two times the rate of global warming. Now, mountain and polar glaciers are committed to melting for decades or centuries with very high confidence, very depressing. This is already baked in. Number four, continued ice loss over the 21st century is virtually certain for the Greenland ice sheets and likely for the Antarctic ice sheets. Now, here we see how the poles experience the greatest absolute change relative to the equatorial regions, up to four or five degrees centigrade with only a 1.5 degrees centigrade rise in relative global mean temperatures. And number five, this is kind of interesting. Cities intensify human-induced warming locally and further urbanization together with more frequent hot extremes will increase the severity of heat waves with very high confidence. That's not great for human health. So now let's take a step back and think about general trends and how the data can be interpreted generally. Number one, the historical global service temperature records highlight that decadal variability has enhanced and masked underlying human-caused long-term changes and this variability will continue into the future. This is very high confidence. Nonetheless, the heating of the climate system continued during this period as reflected in both the continued warming of the global ocean, again, very high confidence, and the continued rise of hot extremes over land. So there are broad trends and short-term variability, and you have to distinguish between the two. Number two, the magnitude and feedback between climate change and the carbon cycle becomes larger and also more uncertain as high CO2 emissions uh, occur. So the trends will accelerate, but become more erratic and unpredictable. Number three, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, is very likely to weaken over the 21st century for all emissions scenarios, but low confidence into the magnitude of this trend and exactly when it may occur. In other words, the main driver of global temperature distribution, including jet streams and ocean currents, will slow down, but we don't know when or by how much. Just have a think, one of the best climate channels on YouTube has a fantastic video exploring this topic, and I'll link that here. And number four, most regions of the world, 96% will experience significant changes in physical climate systems called CIDs. On this chart, where the IPCC has divided the world into a few dozen regions, you can actually customize your own region with a virtual atlas, which I will link down below. Here you can see in this description, different degrees of certainty based on increased changes highlighted in deep purple or decreasing changes highlighted in deep orange. For example, over 45 regions will experience higher temperatures and heat. A similar amount will experience fewer cold spells and frost. About 25 regions will experience heavy precipitation and flooding, and a similar amount will see a decline in snow and glacial ice. Now this doesn't mean the same regions will experience the same phenomena per se, but the absolute numbers are similar to get a sense of the general trends. Now number five, to account for different global emissions scenarios moving forward, the IPCC has five illustrative models called SSPs, which are designated SSPY, or Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, describing the socioeconomic trends underlying the scenario through the year 2100. And the Y refers to the approximate level of radiative forcing in watts per meter squared. That's the amount of heat energy or radiative energy trapped in our atmosphere, which is directly proportional to greenhouse gases. Here, the major contributors or drivers to the greenhouse effect, both positive like CO2 and methane, 
and negative, like sulfur dioxide, are illustrated here. The reference point at 40 gigatons of CO2 per year as of 2015 is very important since that's the baseline for current emissions. Here's another chart breaking down what we can expect in our lifetimes. Here with a relative midterm time estimate between 2041 and 2060, all five scenarios are accounting for at least 1.5 degrees centigrade average warming with the upper limit approaching three degrees in the worst SSP 5 to 8.5 scenario. But this, this is the most important chart in my opinion. From the whole report, and if we focus on this number right here, that's the number 300 or the total amount of future gigatons of net carbon we can extract from the earth and pump into our atmosphere since that is the important tipping point. Here's the bottom line. Every ton of emissions matters, and humankind has already pumped an extra 2,400 gigatons of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Here we can see in this linear graph the potential warming effects for each of the five SSP scenarios based on net emissions moving forward. But if we take a closer look at this chart, it's all laid out pretty clearly. If we limit all future emissions to under 300 gigatons of net carbon, we have an 83% likelihood of staying under 1.5 degrees centigrade from the 19th century baseline, or an additional 0.4 degrees from today's average temperatures. If we blow past that, say 400, that likelihood drops to 67%. If we triple that to approximately 850 gigatons, then we have a 50-50 shot of staying below 1.7 degrees. And if we continue to 2,000 more gigatons of CO2, almost doubling our total emissions to date as a species, then we have only 25% chance of staying under 2 degrees. If you want to stay under the Paris Accords goal of 2 degrees centigrade of average warming, we need to stay pretty strict under that 400 level, and ideally even lower. So what does this mean? Well, if we are currently pumping out 35 to 40 gigatons a year, then we have less than 10 years to slow this down and get to net zero. Is this even possible? Time will tell. But with all the political rambling about the reconciliation package being hacky sacked around Congress, with recent talks about climate initiatives being cut from Biden's latest proposals, putting every political and economic tool at our disposal now to incentivize a low carbon future is paramount. And we can't afford to delay getting to net zero. 2050 may be too late. The future costs of inaction measured in lost agriculture, unusable real estate, mass displacement, extreme weather events, all this will dwarf the upfront investment, which I admit is substantial, to get a more predictable future. More details about these costs and potential interventions will be released next year by different working groups in the IPCC. But the science today doesn't lie, and this report proves that we really are running out of time. So, thanks for watching. Hope you found this helpful. Hit that like button and share it to your skeptical friends. And for more sustainable content, consider subscribing to Saving Green. Thanks for your time. See you in the next one.